Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. It's good to see you. It's 2 o'clock. We want to make sure we're punctual. Uh, the rain is not scheduled to start until 3.05. Um, so we've got time. My name is Joe Blosser. I'm the director of the Service Learning Program and assistant professor in religion and philosophy. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you today uh, to the 2017 Legacy Lecture. It's so good to see so many of you here. The Legacy Lecture was established in 2015 by High Point University's Phi Beta Kappa Exploratory Committee. And this lecture is an honor that is bestowed by our graduating seniors on a faculty member of their choosing who they believe best exemplifies their liberal arts education. This year, hundreds of seniors participated in the nomination and voting process. And I want to express my deep thanks to Haley McEwen, who is the president of the senior class and all of the work that she did. Um, she's really done the senior class proud. Let's have a hand for Haley. This lecture is an occasion for celebration and a reminder of the civic responsibility and intellectual heritage bestowed on HPU students through their liberal arts education. In the words of Dr. Corcoran, who has served as the co-chair of the Legacy Lecture Committee with me this year, the Legacy Lecture pushes students to think about questions like, how do the values inculcated by a liberal arts education, truth, justice, equality, and compassion, inspire and transform our graduates during their time at HPU and after they leave? In what ways do classroom deliberations, for example, examinations of social justice in political science, character and action in English, or problem solving in chemistry or physics, live on in their spirits and their memories and continue to shape their lives? Each year, the Legacy Lecturer challenges students and graduates and educators to discover the deep connections between their coursework at High Point University and the life choices they make and the legacies that they leave behind. So seniors, this is your last lecture. This is your legacy. It's my pleasure to introduce Mr. Luis Royo Romero to introduce our speaker for the day. Luis. My name is Luis Alejandro Rojo Romero, and I want to tell you a story about a life-changing moment the first week I walked into High Point University. I met Dr. Brian Agustin the second day at the university. Dr. Aaron Titus introduced us due to my interest in conducting research on materials. However, what I didn't know that day is that I wasn't meeting another professor or research advisor. I was meeting a new mentor. That day, as my mom likes to refer to him, I met my guardian angel. Dr. Agustin is a loving father of three daughters who loved him dearly. While he loves taking them on hikes, kayaking, and any UNC athletic event possible, he especially loves them and taking selfies with them. In those pictures, you can see the smile of a proud father with an infinite love for his daughters. Every year, he celebrates the best day of his life as a true symbol of his unquantifiable love to his best friend and wife. The day he told me the story about their first date, his eyes shined. His smile got wider, and I saw how much he has loved her for the past 28 years and will continue doing so for the rest of his life. Dr. Agustin is a caring, passionate, and genuine person. Anytime I mention him 
in his name at a conference or amongst professors. People only have the highest regards of him, his accomplishments, his work, and his family. He is possibly the best soccer dad in the tri-state area, coaching from rec league to club to varsity. He cherishes moments with every student he has worked with and encountered, and has many friends across the globe due to his good sense of humor and bright personality. To me, he has been a source of wisdom inside and outside a lab. He has been a friend that I want to celebrate with every UNC win. He has pushed me to become a better student, researcher, person, and a friend. There has been plenty of times that he believed in me before I did. And I saw something in him that he sees in me that nobody else has. I have always wanted to ask you if you wanted to change the world. Because Dr. Augustine, you've changed my world. Thanks to you, I stand in front of all of you. Thanks to you, I'll be graduating in two days and we'll be working in a national lab. Thanks to you, I know it's possible to have a balance between a great professor and a fantastic father. He has been an honor working by your side. And very emotionally, I will say that I will miss you. Yet, I cannot wait to hear the new stories from you working at a lab again this summer. The many goals that Ruth and Rebecca will score. The new project that Rachel will be working on and the new love started with Kristen. So without any further delays, I present to you my mentor and good friend, Dr. Augustine. Thanks, Luis. Now I have to speak. <laughs> um, I appreciate that so much, and I appreciate Joe uh, introducing me. So when I was told by Dr. Blosser about two months ago, three months ago, that I had been nominated to give the legacy lecture to seniors, um, I thought, surely you must be joking. Uh, I'm, there must be a mistake. The legacy lecture is you know, a celebration of the liberal arts, and it's decided by the senior class. And I kind of came up with the top five reasons why I would be an unlikely candidate to be a <laughs> legacy lecture giver. So we'll start number one. Uh, the first re recipient was um, Dr. Carroll, sort of a warm grandfatherly person, give you lots of hugs. Uh, I'm not like that. And uh, the second one was David Bergen, like super cool, amazing guy, cool sunglasses. I'm not like that either. Um, okay, so, so I don't really fit the mold of the prior legacy lecture winners. Um, second thing is, it, it's about the celebration of the liberal arts. And I have taught exactly two classes since I've been at High Point University. General Chemistry one and General Chemistry two. These are completely pragmatic courses. You need them for the MCAT, so you have to take this course. And even if I decided sometime in class to say the importance of why you should learn chemistry and being an educated citizen, et cetera, et cetera, someone would raise their hand and say, is this gonna be on the MCATs? <laughs> Number three, I, along with my chemistry colleagues here, are uh, the killer of dreams. <laughs> Maybe I'll just leave it at that. Uh, number, number four, I have taught, I think, four seniors uh, since I've been here, and I'm not exaggerating about that. So I thank the four seniors for voting for me. That was, was very nice. Um, and then the, the top reason is, actually, uh, my advisor told me this in graduate school when I was getting ready to graduate. He said, the quickest way to end a conversation at a cocktail party is to tell him you're a chemistry professor. <laughs> so there's only three responses to this. One is, 
O. The second one is, I hated chemistry. And the third one is, you must be really smart. I always say, yes, of course I am. Thank you for recognizing that. Um, seriously, it's a tremendous honor to be um, recognized by the seniors for them to ask me to give this lecture. I have to confess, you know, I'm nervous. This isn't way out of my comfort zone. Um, I appreciate the four students who voted for me. That, that was really a really nice thing for you to do. And I'd like to congratulate the seniors who are here. This seems to be not a senior legacy lecture, more of a faculty legacy lecture. But for the seniors who are here, uh, I congratulate you on behalf of the faculty, on behalf of the staff, on behalf of the administration. Um, this is a major milestone, a big crossroads in your life. And um, if only I had a blanket to give you, which then you could give to somebody else. But you'll, you'll get that in two days, I think. OK, so we'll, let's get started. Um, there's not going to be any quizzes. There's not going to be any exams. Uh, there's not going to be any papers to write. There's no required reading for this lecture. Um, hopefully, maybe at some point, you'll want to read some things as, as a result of it. That'd be great. But there's nothing required of you today. Um, I want to personally challenge you to take the harder road. There's, the easy road's easy. And a lot of momentum and inertia sort of, sort of heads you in that direction. I have to confess that the culture we live in, the society we live in, it's easy to get distracted. It's easy to not read and to think about things and think about things that are important. And I mean, I feel this myself, and I know it's, it's very difficult as someone who's 18, 19, 20, 20 years old. Um, but I'm going to challenge you to push beyond that and to, and to think about things that are bigger than just yourselves. All right, so I've titled this lecture, Ripples in the Ocean. I was told yesterday by Dr. Kubain that oceans don't have ripples. So I'm going to have to convince him, and hopefully convince you, that there is such a thing as a ripple in, an, in the ocean. But I wanted to define some terms first. So the first term uh, I'm going to define is, what do I mean by ocean? When I say ocean, I'm referring to all of humanity throughout all of history. So just go big, right? I mean, we might as well start with a really big theme. And you and I are just mere drops in that ocean. There's billions of people on the planet. There's been billions of people that have lived on the planet. And we're just one person. So I think deep in our souls, we want to feel like we have significance. We want to leave a legacy. We want to feel like something's important and that we have something to do with that. So how do we, just one person out of billions of people, how, do, how can we make an impact in this world? The second assumption I want to make is that the vast majority of people who are listening right now or who might listen in the future um, are never going to be famous. I don't have a great definition of famous, so I will use, if you have a Wikipedia page, you're famous. Um, giving the legacy lecture is not a path to fame. I know this because Dr. Carroll is, does not have a Wikipedia page, and neither does Dr. Bergen. I'm quite confident I will never have a Wikipedia page. Dr. Cobain does have a Wikipedia page. <laughs> but just because it's, we don't have Wikipedia pages doesn't mean that we should be, that fame is the only thing we should be striving for. Significance is a different thing. What Dr. Carroll, what Dr. Bergen, what myself, and actually what all of you have in common is we are incredibly blessed people, we live in an incredibly blessed nation. Just think about some of the blessings that we have that sometimes we just take for granted. Fabulously wealthy society, wealthy beyond almost all measure and, and beyond all measure relative to history. We have not seen war on our shores for 150 years. And that's amazing. I mean, a lot of countries is a daily reminder of that. We're relatively free of diseases. I mean, most of the common diseases have been eradicated in the United States. There's boundless information. There's boundless entertainment. There's boundless recreation. That could be good or bad, but there's, there's plenty of it available. Um, you can go to the grocery store and buy fresh fruits and vegetables any day of the year. That's an amazing thing. Uh, I lived in South Africa for seven months. I have a lot of friends there. I can get on my, on my phone and I can video chat with somebody in real time in South Africa practically for free. I can get on an airplane and visit them a day and a half later for about $1,000. I mean, that, that is incredible. Think about that. 50 years ago, people would think that's amazing. 500 years ago, people wouldn't even be able to dream that that was even possible. But despite all this, we still feel like something, something's wrong with our world. There's, there's, Tensions building. 
I'm going to avoid politics purposely. <laughs> the last year we've had plenty of politics. Um, but you can, you can tell there's angry and hurting people all around the world, not just in the United States. And you can hear it on the news, you can see it on Twitter, read the comments sections of any major website, and you can, you can read sort of an anger and, and angst that's building in people. So I want you to think about something, and this statistic kind of shocked me when I looked this up. If you, um, if you go to look at adults in the United States, Take a guess what percentage of adults hold a bachelor's degree. I'll give you five seconds to think about that. Turns out it's only 32% of American adults actually hold a bachelor's degree. Now, academics live in a bubble, and we're, we're like hopelessly lost in the bubble because every single person that we know has a bachelor's degree. I mean, half the people we know have PhDs, for goodness sakes. Take, so everyone we know, everyone we hang out with has gone to college, but Two out of every three adults have not gone to college or have not completed a bachelor's degree. Maybe they started. Take a guess of what percentage of black 25 years and older male uh, adults have a bachelor's degree. If you said 16.5%, you got an advanced copy of my, of my speech. And Latinos only um, is 13.5% Latino adults have, hold a bachelor's degree. So how do we, I mean, who are so blessed and we have all these opportunities, how do we help change things in this country? Yet we're just a ripple in the ocean. All right, so I'm going to um, give you my bias. Have, every speaker has a bias. Uh, I'm a Christian, and most Christians have a life verse, or many Christians have a life verse. Mine is uh, Luke 12, 48. And when you paraphrase this, it says, uh, to whom much is given, much is expected, or much is required. So my assumption number three if you're graduating from High Point University in the year 2017, you've been given much, and therefore much is expected of you. So, how are we, just a mere drop in the ocean, highly unlikely to ever have a Wikipedia page, have any chance of making the slightest difference in this world? So the thesis of my talk, Ripples in the Ocean, which do exist, Nito, um, is summed up beautifully in a quote by Mother Teresa, and I saw Preston somewhere Hat tip to Preston Davis, he told me this the other day. Um, none of us can do great things. This is from Mother Teresa. None of us can do, uh, not all of us can do great things, but we can do small things with great love. All right, so let's get started on, uh, I'm gonna give you a couple examples of what I'm talking about, this, this idea of doing small things with great love. I'll start with, uh, why not with math and physics? Because I mean, the four people who voted for me voted for a chemist, so let's start with math and physics. Um, the 1960s, an entirely new field of applied mathematics uh, was developed. That field has become known as nonlinear dynamics. This is where everyone's eyes kind of glaze over. So many of you probably have never heard of this, but you might have heard of some of the catchy names that, that were associated with it. One of these is called chaos theory. You might have heard of that term. And the other one, probably most of you have heard, is called the butterfly effect. And even though you may have heard of that term, the butterfly effect, you may not know where that actually comes from or what that's actually referring to. So I'm not a mathematician. Out of respect for my math colleagues, I'm going to not give you any equations or anything. But um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the way scientists and mathematicians think. We're a greedy group. And when I say greedy, we want to understand the world, and we want to understand it mathematically. We want to actually be able to describe phenomena mathematically. And we'd like to have it, ideally, have predictive powers. So what that means is if you have some set of starting conditions in your experiment, you'd like to be able to predict somewhere down the road, okay, this is going to happen so many days in the future, so many months in the future. So think about just the weather. I've been watching the weather all day. I know other people have. Wouldn't it be great if we could predict with full accuracy three days in advance or three months in advance? We're greedy. Why don't we go for three years in advance? We want to know what the weather exactly is going to be three years in advance. Now, I know the guys setting up chairs for graduation would love to know two days in advance. Okay? But we want to know three years in advance exactly what's going to happen with the weather around the world. It would also be amazing if we could model like where there's going to be an outbreak of cholera or where there's going to be an outbreak of Ebola mathematically. We can sort of see some trends emerging and say this is where this is where there's going to be a problem. Or what about political instabilities in some country? Maybe some rival factions are competing against each other. We'd like to know where that might happen. Where we need to put extra police protection in a city. All this is involved with mathematical modeling. So this is a really ambitious goal. 
And before the 1960s, this wasn't possible at all. You might think about what changed in the 1960s. The invention of the high-speed computer is what, what happened. And by high-speed computing, you can start doing these massive calculations with these really complex data sets. So physicists used to do stuff like model the flow of water dripping out of a faucet. Okay? And you might think, wow, that's no wonder why I didn't like physics. Um, but they would take Newton's laws and they'd apply them to the dripping of water out of a faucet. And when the water is coming out very slowly, they could do it very accurately. Okay? And Newton's laws worked pretty well. But you didn't have to do much. Just turn it up a little bit. And all of a sudden, no matter how much you tried, you could not model it accurately. You could never predict when that next drop was going to come. So that is called a dynamical process. Dynamical means it's changing with time. So the idea here is that physicists and mathematicians quickly realized we can't model any dynamic systems. None of them work because the equations we're using don't work. So there's no way we're going to be able to model what the weather is going to be like three years from now if we can't predict water dripping out of a faucet. So they came up with this field called nonlinear dynamics. I'm not going to go into the details of what that means, nonlinear. It just has to do with the types of equations that they use. But the idea caught people's imagination with this idea of the butterfly effect. So this, this says some small change happens on one side of the globe, like a butterfly flapping its wings in Australia. And that results in a change in the weather on the other side of the globe in ways that are entirely unpredictable. All right, so you can have these equations. You can try modeling it. But any some little change results in some massive change further down the road. And it's really, really difficult to model and predict what that is. That's what I'm going to call ripples in the ocean, OK? You make a small change in someone's life, and it has massive changes down the road, but you don't know what those changes are necessarily going to be. It's very hard to predict what those are going to be. All right, so I'm going to, I'm going to give some other examples of this. I'm sure you're glad we're ending the physics and math part of this, except Aaron. Aaron's probably happy we're doing this. Um, I'm going to start with uh, the book Les Mis. Many of you are familiar with this book. You're probably familiar with the Broadway play, mostly maybe the, maybe the um, uh, movie adaptation of the play. The book is a big one. Uh, I've only read part of it. I have not read the whole book, I'll confess. My daughter is in the process of reading it right now. She will, she'll finish it long before I do. It's an amazing story. It's set in France in 1815. The protagonist, Jean Valjean, he's uh, been in prison for 19 years for breaking a window pane. Um, the main story or the main thesis of this book is between the inspector of the prison, whose name is Jean Valjean, and, or excuse me, Inspector Javert, and Valjean. Valjean's paroled, and he's given this yellow sheet of paper, and he's asked to, he can leave now. Except now he's got a new prison sentence, because no one wants anyone with this yellow piece of paper coming into their city. So Javert believes in his mind, he's a defender of the law, he believes once you're a criminal, always a criminal. So just because you've left the prison, you might as well still be a, uh, a criminal. So that's the main narrative of, of the book. It's the main narrative of the, of the play. But there's a ripple in the ocean, uh, the butterfly effect that I want you to pick up on. Those of you who haven't read the book, I'll tell you the beginning. This happens right at the beginning of the book. And I'm actually going to read to you a little bit of this. This is from Hugo. So at this moment, there was a violent knock on the door. Come in, said the bishop. The door opened. It opened quickly, quite wide, as if pushed by someone boldly and with energy. A man entered. He came in, took one step, and paused, leaving the door open behind him. He had his knapsack on his back, his stick in his hand, and a rough, hard, tired, and fierce look in his eyes. He was hideous. It was an apparition of ill omen. Madame Magloire had not even the strength to scream. She stood trembling with her mouth open. The bishop looked upon the man with a tranquil eye. As he was opening his mouth to speak, doubtless to ask the stranger what he wanted, the man, leaning with both hands on his club, glanced from one to another in turn, and without waiting for the bishop to speak, said in a loud voice, See here, my name is Jean Valjean. I'm a convict. I've been 19 years in the galleys. Four days ago, I was set free. Today, I've walked 12 leagues. When I reached this place this evening, I went to an inn. They sent me away on account of my yellow passport, which I had shown at the mayor's office. I went to another inn. They said, Get out. I went to the fields to sleep beneath the stars. There were no stars. I thought it would rain. There was no good God to stop the drop, so I came back to the town to get the shelter of some doorway. There in the square I lay upon a stone. A good woman showed me her house and said, knock there. I have knocked. What is this place? Are you an inn? I will pay. I'm very tired. Twelve leagues on foot, and I'm so hungry. Can I stay? Madame Magloire, said the bishop, put on another plate. 
is the first ripple in the ocean in this story. Valjean's given a warm, clean bed. Hugo writes, for nearly 20 years he had not slept in a bed, and although he had not undressed, the sensation was too novel not to disturb his sleep. Now Valjean, during dinner, noticed that there were six silver plates and a silver ladle right near the dinner table. And he started thinking. Uh, Hugo says it pressed upon his mind while he was in his bed. So Valjean made a decision to steal the silver, to run to safety. It says he leaped over the wall like a tiger and fled. But it wasn't long before he was captured, dragged back to the bishop's house by three policemen. The bishop intervened in the conversation. Ah, there you are, he said, looking toward Jean Valjean. I'm glad to see you, but I gave you the candlesticks also, which are silver like the rest, and would bring you 200 francs. Why did you not take them along with the plates? Jean Valjean opened his eyes and looked at the bishop with an expression which no human tongue could describe. My friend, said the bishop, before you go away, here are, here are your candlesticks. Take them. Jean Valjean was trembling in every limb. He took the two candlesticks mechanically and with a wild appearance. Now, said the bishop, go in peace. The bishop approached him and said in a low voice, forget not, never forget that you've promised me to use the silver to become an honest man. It is your soul that I'm buying for you. So the bishop has just unleashed a ripple in the ocean that turns into a tsunami. Those of you who know the story know Jean Valjean takes this, he rips up the passbook, first thing he does, breaks the law, and then he goes and becomes an honest man. He starts a business. He actually ends up hiring hundreds of employees. He ends up becoming the mayor of his city. So just like that flap of a butterfly's wing in Australia, this one little thing turns into a massive change. Now, the point I want you to get is this cost the bishop something. Okay, it wasn't, it wasn't nothing. He gave him something that had value. The bishop gave up his value. Also, he didn't know how this was going to end. He didn't know Jean Valjean was going to end up being the mayor of a city. So this is much like the butterfly effect, right? A small investment that's a little bit risky that ends up yielding big results. All right, now I'm going to give you uh, an example from... We've given you an example from mathematics. We've given you an example from uh, literature. I'm going to give you an example from religion. So um, I'm going to tell you a little bit of the story of the book of Ruth. It's one of my favorite stories in the Bible. Uh, unfortunately, my daughter Ruth is not here. She's named after this story. Uh, she has a conference soccer game a little bit later, so she couldn't come here uh, today. But um, let me give you sort of the overview of this story. There's a lady named Naomi. Um, she's, an, she's an Israelite. And she is, uh, her, she's married to a man, and she has two sons. And a famine hit, strikes the land of Israel. So they're forced to leave the land of Israel to go to another country because of the famine. There's no, there's no food there. So they go to the country of Moab, which is actually a neighboring country, but a, really a hated country, a hated people. They go there, and they end up there for 10 years. So in the course of 10 years, they've assimilated into the culture of Moab. And how do I know they've assimilated? Well, both of these her sons have married women from Moab, okay? So they've taken on wives from another, from another land. Um, then disaster strikes Naomi 10 years later. Her husband dies, both of her sons die. We're not told why, we don't know if it's disease, we don't know what's caused this, but both of them have died. And this leaves her with no inheritance, no money, no grandchildren, no means of support, her only choice is to go back to Israel, back to her family, back to her land, her people. In the meanwhile, she tells her two, uh, she tells her two daughters-in-law, Orpah and Ruth, don't come with me. There's nothing back in Israel for you. Go back to your own people because they can help you. They can support you. There's no point in coming back with me. So she convinces Orpah to go back to her family. But Ruth is not willing to do that. She wants to go with Naomi. And in one of the most beautiful professions of loyalty in all of Scripture, she says, um, Do not urge me to leave you or to return from following you. For where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May the Lord do so to me, and all, more also, if anything but death departs me from you. And when Naomi saw she was determined to go with her, she said no more. Now, this is a very popular passage. You might have heard of this. Uh, it's read at weddings quite often. But they don't read the where you die, I will die part of the, that, that passage. Na uh, Ruth knew she was basically going to a death sentence. Okay, she was a young lady. 
she was married, so she was damaged goods, and there was really nothing for her in Israel except Naomi, but she was willing to go. So this is the first ripple in the ocean in this story. The plot thickens. Okay, good. Uh, there's more to this story. I don't have time to go through all of it, but um, there's a co sort of complicated series of laws uh, that are kind of built in, and one of the rules that they have in Israel is when you're farming, you're not to farm all the way to the edge of, the, of your property because it's supposed to be a means of the poor people to have some food. It's sort of a welfare system built into the, built into the structure of the country. So that's called gleaning, if the poor people go and, and to this place. So Naomi sends Ruth to glean in this field of a distant relative. And the distant relative, his name is Boaz. He's already heard about, Na about Ruth. He's already heard about this woman who's come back from Moab to be with his mother-in-law. And so he tells his, his workers, don't just let her glean, let her harvest. I mean, let her pick as much as she wants. So she comes home with this huge bag of food, and Naomi's like, where in the world did you get that? Where have you been? She said, I was in this field over here, this guy named Boaz. And she says, he's one of our relatives. And he's a special, he's a certain kind of rel special kind of relative called a kinsman redeemer. So this happens a few times, brings home a bounty of food, and Naomi goes for broke. Says, you should ask him to marry you. And she does. And Boaz agrees to do this. And it's a big decision because he actually has to turn his land over to Naomi by doing this. But he agrees to, he agrees to marry her. So this is a second big ripple in the ocean. Now, many of you know, you know where this story is heading. Um, Ruth ends up bearing a son. And her son uh, is named Obed, who's the father of Jesse, the father of David, King David. So she ends up being the grandmother of King David from another culture, and King Solomon is his son, and eventually, if you follow it all the way into the book of Matthew, Jesus is part of that line as well. All right, I'm going to give you a final example. This is a personal example. I have never told this story. Uh, no one at High Point University knows this story. Uh, it happened quite a long time ago to me. Um, yeah, just nobody, nobody's heard this at High Point University. So. My wife and I, when we were in graduate school, uh, I was a second year grad student, she was a first year grad student at Chapel Hill, and we were trying to live out this life verse, you know, to whom much is given, much is expected. So we decided to volunteer at this uh, agency called Orange County Volunteers for Youth. It's uh, basically big brothers, big sisters. It's a mentoring program where, you, where people are matched up with disadvantaged children. Um, so we were assigned to this child, an 11 year old boy, his name was Tristan Jackson. Pudgy little kid. Uh, my wife and I were into um, academics. I mean, both of us were grad students. Uh, we both liked hiking and camping, um, athletics. We both played tennis, this and that. We liked Tar Heel basketball. This has been a wonderful year for us. Um, it was a wonderful year then, too. They won the national championship that year. Um, so Tristan was into TV. Uh, we actually did not own a TV. Our marriage counselor had suggested to us, why don't your first year of marriage, you know, don't get a TV. There's other things to do your first year when you're married. Um, this is excellent advice to uh, seniors, by the way. Don't, don't get a TV your first year. So apparently one of those better things to do was to spend four hours a week with this boy, Tristan Jackson. Our first uh, visit didn't start out so auspiciously. We decided to take him to Ben and Jerry's. What kid does not like ice cream, right? Ben and Jerry's. So we get to Ben and Jerry's, and he tells us he doesn't like ice cream. All right, so we get to Ben and Jerry's. We're like, oh, this is going to be a long four hours. Um, then we, you know, you know the board at Ben and Jerry's. got all those crazy, you know, New York super fudge chunk and all these great things. And um, he said he wanted vanilla. So we're trying to talk him out of vanilla. And he grudgingly has vanilla. And it's not until later that we realize he's never been to an ice cream shop where it costs $5 for an ice cream. I mean, that would be like an entire meal at Hardee's, right? And he's only seen vanilla and chocolate coming out of the machine at Hardee's. So he doesn't know what vanilla super fudge chunk is. Um, his mother didn't trust us. Every day we'd go to pick him up once a week, she'd sort of crack the door open, look, give us a scowl, she'd yell for, uh, yell for Tristan to come out and kind of close the door in our face. Now my wife and I were kind of thinking, man, where's the thanks? Where's the appreciation of this? And you know, that was really naive at the time because from, her perspe from our perspective, we're doing this great thing, right? We're doing this amazing butterfly effect thing. 
Um, but from her perspective, this was like a mirror held up in front of her face. You know, she could see that her choices she had made, things that had happened, were kind of a failure. And so her husband is in jail. She's on welfare. She's got two boys who are about to be teenagers. And here comes these two 23-year-old white kids who think they know what they're doing, have no know nothing about parenting, right? And we're just going to save them. One particularly memorable day that we had, uh, we, my wife and I said, well, let's, let's take them to the beach and uh, you know, show them that there's a world's bigger than, than Carborough, North Carolina. So we went to Wrightsville Beach, picked them up early in the morning, we drove down there. It was like Ferris Bueller's day off. Okay, all these great things happened when we were there. Uh, of course, he saw the beach and you know, heard the sounds and the smells and all that was wonderful. Um, then he, uh, I was teaching him how to body surf and this guy came up to us and saw us and he's like, hey, do you want to like really learn how to surf? So he had a surfboard and he was teaching Tristan how, how to actually surf, which you know, I've never done. I thought that was really cool. We had dolphins like swimming as far as I am away from you, like jumping up next to us. I mean, it was amazing. Like everything, all these cool things happened. We took him out to dinner, we went to a real seafood restaurant. So we're, you know, my wife and I are on, you know, kind of buzzing after this and we're on our way back to Chapel Hill. We're in the car and we're like, so what do you think about it, Tristan? I mean, did you have a good, was it fun? Like tell, tell me what your best thing is. He proceeded to list off every television show he had missed in the last 12 hours. I'm not kidding you, this kid was a TV guide. He went and listed every show. I almost drove off the road. And so here's, here's my little lesson for you about this. Um, nowhere in the last 25 minutes have I told you that you're gonna get a lot of thanks and it's gonna be easy. Okay, I'm, I'm not promising you that everyone's going to say, hey, this is wonderful what you're doing. The story continued. Um, my wife and I raised money to send him to Fork Union Military Academy uh, boarding school in Virginia. Cost $15,000 a year to send him there. Um, the day I signed the enrollment contract, my hand was literally shaking because that was more money than the two of us made combined on my graduate sc school stipend. Um, we sent out fundraising letters to all the friends we knew, all the people we knew, um, churches and family and everything else, and checks just started pouring in. People, you know, a lot of people we knew, obviously, but there were people we didn't even know. Like, we'd get a $50 check from somebody, a $100 check from somebody. It was a friend of a friend of a friend. You know, they had heard about it and wanted to invest in Tristan's life. And before you know it, we raised $15,000 for four years, and it came almost to the penny is the amount of money that we, were, that we were able to, to raise. So you'd think, all right, the sky's the limit here. Um, he actually ended up failing out of college after a year. He, he got into a college, and he failed. He wasn't used to the freedom of being by himself and not having a, a, that sort of disciplined structure of military school. Then the school of hard, uh, hard knocks took over. He had to start learning what it was like to be on his own. He worked a night shift at Sheets. He entered the police academy, and he became a, a commissioned police officer eventually. He started taking college classes, one class at a time, three credits at a time. First at a community college, got his associate's degree. Now at James Madison University, he's, uh, I think, about six credits short of graduating with a bachelor's degree in English. He's an amazing writer. Um, plenty of forks in the road. He got married. Uh, he has two beautiful children. Um, tried taking chemistry class, supporting a family. It's a lot harder when you're 35 years old than when you're 20 years old. He's actually now serving on the board of Big Brothers Big Sisters up in Virginia. He's a community... Uh, he's an icon in, in his community. So he's a few credits away from graduating from JMU. He's a proud father of two. He's a loyal husband. He's a good friend of my, my wife and my family. My kids call him Uncle Tristan. Um, he and I have discussed writing a book about his experiences, our experiences together. Maybe me just telling you will force me to do some of it. It's very, as anyone who's written a book knows, it's very difficult to find the time to do that. Um, his part of the story is going to be a million times more interesting than my part of the story. So let me conclude with this. Um, I've titled this lecture Ripples in the Ocean because even though we're mere drops in the ocean, our little effects can have big, big uh, results down the road. Remember Mother Teresa says, not all of us can do great things, but we can do small things with great love. And these small acts can and do have significance down the road. More importantly, there are ways we don't necessarily know. Remember the bishop, he, he didn't know that giving those candlesticks was gonna change Valjean's life and all the life of the people that he interacted with. Um, 
Ruth didn't know up to give, know that giving her life up, she was going to be grafted into the line of King David. And my wife and I certainly did not know when we volunteered, taking Tristan to Ben and Jerry's, that someday we would get to see his graduation from high school. We would get to see his, we'd be there on his wedding day. We get to see him commissioned as a police officer. And soon we'll get to see him graduate from college. All these small drops leading to huge waves further down the road. I'm going to close with a parable. Some of you may have heard of this before. Um, I actually, it was spoken at my graduation. Who says no one remembers anything from their graduation? Um, I did a little research last week. I found out that this is the original story is from 1969. It's called the Star Thrower, but it's evolved quite a bit. So the version I heard was not the original version. Uh, so I'll tell, you, I'll tell you the version that I heard. And I actually used this in one of the fundraising letters uh, for Tristan. So there's a man, there's an older man walking along the beach. He's, uh, he notices, for whatever reason, a bunch of starfish have washed upon the shore. And the tide is receding, and they are now dying in the, in the sunlight. So he picks them up, starts throwing them back into the, into the surf. And he's working his way down the beach, and there's thousands and thousands, I mean, as far as the eye can see. Meanwhile, there's another guy who's watching him, and he's saying, um, just kind of shaking his head and smirking, because he sees all these starfish, and this guy kind of wasting his time doing this. Finally, he can't take it anymore. So he shouts over the, the surf, hey, why are you wasting your time doing that? You're never going to save all those starfish. The guy has one in his hand. He says, I know I can't save all of them, but at least I can save this one, and throws it in. Good luck, High Point University. Always be on the lookout for dying starfish and see ways that you can do small things with great love. Congratulations. On behalf of the uh, faculty and the senior class, we'd like to present Dr. Augustine with the uh, plaque noting that he's the recipient of the 2017 Legacy Lecture. Well, please join us for refreshments uh, behind us, and we'll see you next year, some of you. Further.